Well, hello, my name is Rob Collis, and I'm on the pastoral team at St. Peter's Fireside. Uh, and I'm excited to be with you for this re-recording of our sermon today. Uh, we had some technical difficulties this morning, so um, we got to do it again. Uh, just a quick note before I begin, uh, this sermon, I'm going to be looking at the Bible a lot, and I'd really encourage you to have a Bible with you so you can read along with me. Um, you can uh, just pull up a, a physical Bible if, if you've got one with you. I'll be using the NIV translation. Uh, if you don't have one in front of you, you can also just pull up your phone, um, either open up a Bible app, or you can, can just go to BibleGateway.com or any other Bible website and just follow along with me today. Uh, I think that'll be very helpful for you. A number of years ago, I was taking the bus home after a church event. Uh, I was at Main and Broadway, and I had to switch buses and cross the street. And there was a man there who just gave me this puzzled look. He was just standing there looking at me, and he said, Hey, what's the deal with people having those weird black marks on their head today? Now, it was Ash Wednesday, the beginning of Lent, and it's a custom for Christians to mark their foreheads with ash in the sign of the cross. And we just finished up our own service where we did that, and so I had black, a black cross on my forehead. And in all fairness, it looks pretty weird. So waiting for the light to change, I simply just said to this guy that it was the beginning of Lent, and that Christians marked themselves with the cross to commemorate the start of Lent. And he wasn't very impressed by that, or with me for that matter. And the light changed, I was able to cross the street, so I started walking across the street, and he just stayed there. And as I was halfway across the road, he called out to me, yelling, You've been drinking the Kool-Aid! And I, I turned around and called back, Just a little bit! Now, it's not Ash Wednesday today. Uh, don't worry, we, we don't have any ash to put on your fa- foreheads today. You have to wait until February for that. But we're in the second week of the season of Advent. And as Grady explained last week, Advent is a season of waiting and expectation, as we wait and get ready for the coming of Jesus. And yes, this is the build-up to Christmas, when we will celebrate how Jesus came as a baby. But Advent is preparing us for something more than just celebrating Jesus' birth. You see, ultimately, Advent is preparing us for the day when Jesus will return. Because Jesus is coming back. Now, if that guy on the street heard me say that, maybe he'd wonder when I'm going to pull out a tinfoil hat. I, I, I don't have one. But actually, the return of Jesus is a central tenet of the Christian faith. And that's what I want to look at today. Today we're going to be looking together at 2 Peter chapter 3. And 2 Peter, it's a letter written to a group of Christians who are experiencing heckling and scoffing because of their belief in Jesus. Particularly because of their belief that Jesus is going to come again. And that makes it a perfect passage for Advent. So if you have your Bible in front of you, I invite you to turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 3, uh, beginning in verse 8. In verse 8 we read, Do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since we are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom that God gave him. Now, after reading that and hearing that, you might be thinking, okay, Rob, well, maybe you're not wearing a tin hat, but are you sure Peter wasn't? And yes, I'm pretty sure. But this is a challenging passage, isn't it? Perishing, melting, the end of the world. It's kind of intense. How do we read a passage like this? And what on earth do we do with it? 
Now, I believe difficult passages are in the Bible for a reason. They're not there to confuse us. Rather, they're there to instruct us in our faith, just like the rest of Scripture. And I love the collect prayer that we prayed earlier in our service today. Uh, Collect prayer collects all of our individual prayers together as one. And every Sunday we have a collect for the day. And the collect for this Sunday, the second Sunday of Advent, might be my favorite. And I want to read it for us again. Blessed Lord, who caused all Holy Scripture to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and the coming of your Holy Word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God for ever and ever. Amen. It says all scripture is written for our learning, including the difficult parts. And so then we prayed, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, so that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. And I love that. Hear, read, mark, learn, inwardly digest. You, You see, this isn't just a reading for the sake of getting more information. This is a way of reading the Bible so that we don't just understand information and stuff, but but so that these words might come alive to us, and they might live inside of us. I think this is such a brilliant model and pattern for how to read the Bible. It's a model I would encourage you to try for yourself. And today, I I want to use that pattern to work through 2 Peter. And conveniently, we've already done the first two steps, haven't we? In fact, if you were here for the whole service today, uh, you've done them twice with me already. So I want to just break this into a slightly more manageable chunk as we go through this passage together. And we're going to read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest this passage together. And it's my hope that by doing this, that we not only understand more of what this passage is about, or maybe begin to understand more of what this passage is about, but that we can use this method to engage the Bible more deeply for ourselves. So you're kind of getting two sermons for the price of one today. You're getting a sermon on the second coming, and also on how to read the Bible. Uh, So you're welcome for that. So let's look at this first section together. In 2 Peter chapter 3, uh, beginning in verse 8, it reads, Do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But let's let's mark this passage up a bit. See, it begins with an instruction. Do not forget this one thing, dear friends. And, and quickly, before we get to what we're not meant to forget, I want to zoom out quickly to the rest of the letter. Because you see, when we come to these difficult passages in the Bible, they're never just silos. They're not lone floating islands of scripture. They are always there in context with the rest of the surroundings. And it can be really helpful to read the chapter before and after to get a sense of the bigger picture of what's being said. If we zoom out on all of Second Peter, it's actually a pretty short letter, it's only three chapters in total, um, and you can very easily read it uh, later today or later this week for yourself. But as we zoom out and read the whole thing, we, we find that there's a recurring theme and motif of forgetting and knowing. And I've actually... Uh, marked this all up in my own Bible, which I have here with me. I just took a pencil and just kind of circled all of these things. But all throughout, Peter ke- keeps talking about reminding and remembering and refreshing your memory. And really quickly, in verse uh, chapter 1, verse 2, he writes, Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. And then in, uh, a little bit later in verse 5 and 6, he lists a number of things saying, Make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control. In verse 12, he says, I will always remind you of these things. Verse 13, I think it is right to refresh your memory. Verse 15, I'll make every effort to see that after my departure, you'll always be able to remember these things. You can see why I suggested you wanted to have a Bible in front of you. Uh, If we skip ahead to chapter 3, he writes in verse 1, This is now my second letter to you. I've written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. 
I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Saviour through your apostles. And then he talks about this group that have forgotten these things. And in, in verse 5 he says, They deliberately forget. Deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being, and the earth was formed out of water and by water. So as you can see, if we start circling all these things, and there's a few I've, I've left out, but as we start circling all these things, start marking up our Bible and seeing there's, there's something important coming together here, this theme and motif. And as we start marking those things that occur over and over, we start seeing that there's, there's something very important about this. And th this is how we begin to learn from Scripture, by paying attention and digging into the stuff like this, as we seek to understand and in Second Peter, what we've seen is that there's something significant about what we know, about remembering and knowing. And it's not just about knowing, it's about knowing rightly, because this matters for our faith. Peter says his purpose in writing is to stimulate us to wholesome thinking. And, and this wholesome thinking, it, it's not a, a positive attitude, mindfulness kind of thing. Other translations say, stirring up your sincere mind, or to hold your minds in a state of undistracted attention. You see, this is about learning and knowing and holding fast to what matters, about what's true about God. And Peter tells us how to do this. He says in chapter 3, verse 2, I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Saviour through your apostles. And now I, I know I'm doing this whole meta sermon, how to read the Bible to understand the second coming of Jesus thing here. But you see, Peter is actually doing the very same thing himself, isn't he? He's saying, read the scriptures carefully. Pay attention. Do not forget what has already been said. And just to bring it back to our passage in verse 8, he writes, Do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. Now, in my Bible, I've got this nifty little reference thing on the side in the margins. And some Bibles have this, where uh, the editors have, have given little notes and comments to help you see references and similarities to other parts of the Bible. That can be really helpful. Uh, I've got a little note here in my Bible with a reference to Psalm 90 verse 4. And so this week I went and I looked it up, and, and Psalm 90 verse 4 says, A thousand years in your sight, like a day that has just gone by. Do you see what Peter's done? Peter is actually modeling this very practice for us. Do not forget what scripture says, he says. This is what the scriptures say. Peter himself has heard and read the scriptures, and he's marked them up and he's learnt them. And that, that doesn't just happen overnight. It, it, you can't do it all overnight. He spent the time to learn what the Bible says. And as he's put in the time and he's learnt these things, he's, he's digested them and he's reflected on them. And so then in verse 9, he says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Peter's inwardly digesting Psalm 90, verse 4. And you see, Peter's imagination for what God is like was informed by his dwelling in the scriptures and, and in praying the Psalms. And as he prayed through the scriptures, he came to understand how God had revealed himself to us. And this informed his understanding of who God is. His concept of God was not beholden to the whims and ideas of the zeitgeist of his day. And in the face of the social pressures and ideas of his own day, he could point towards a fuller picture of who God is. Not in according to how we feel he ought to be, but in light of what God has actually done and said. And as he dwelt in Psalm 90, Peter inwardly digested it, and he came to realize two things about God. First, Peter realized that God is not bound by our expectations of him. And second, God is more patient and merciful than we could ever begin to comprehend. So let's just look at that first one. So Peter realized that God is not bound by our expectations of him. You see, in his day, there was this group who didn't want to have their ideas of God informed by Scripture. And they began scoffing some of the beliefs that Christians were holding, especially the idea that Jesus was coming again. And Peter 
tells us about these people. And he says in chapter 3, verse 3, Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming? He promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. You see, their experience of life and their reflections about how God works in time were informed by their own experience with time. And they projected their own experiences of time onto God. And they thought, if, if we are bound by time, then surely God must be too. Peter says that they had forgotten. And he, he says it pretty strongly. He says they deliberately forgot all the things that God had said and done. They didn't have that, that wholesome thinking which Peter is seeking to cultivate in the minds of his readers. They weren't holding their minds in a state of undistracted attention. And as a result, they didn't know God rightly. And in their hearts, they had, their hearts had become hardened towards God. And to the point that they were now scoffing and ridiculing these ideas about him. But Peter remembers the Psalms. How in Psalm 90 verse 4 it says, A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by. So he quotes it to them, saying, With the Lord a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. You see, God's timing is, is different than ours. And he's not caught in the hustle and the bustle of our instant world. Perhaps we also scoff at the thought that time will end, at the thought that there will be a day when Jesus returns. But I, I wonder if our scoffing and ridicule is actually a symptom of something else. You see, to scoff at something, to, to ridicule it, means that our hearts are hardened towards that thing. And we have placed it as something that is beneath us. You see, scoffing is an outworking of pride, as, as we estimate that that thing is, is underneath us and, and not worthy of our attention. And this, this group in Peter's day were, were scoffing at the idea that, that Jesus would come again. And if, in our pride, we say that Jesus coming again is a thought that's beneath us, then I suspect it's because there is something about Jesus viscerally entering into our sense of time and taking control of time that we find threatening. And maybe it's just that we don't want to look like a fool, or, or maybe there's something about Jesus being in control that makes us feel uneasy. Because it means that we can't be in control. Whatever it is, we're trying to constrain God to our expectations of him and our experiences of life. And Peter is saying, it doesn't work like that. Don't forget who he is, what he's said, what he's done. As we dwell on these things and as we inwardly digest them for ourselves, Peter's first reflection is that God is not bound by our expectations of him. Second, he realizes that God is more patient and merciful than we could ever begin to comprehend. And I want to back up to verse 5 quickly here. It says, But they, the, the scoffers, deliberately forget that long ago by God's word, the heavens came into being, and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also the world of that, of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Peter is telling us, the Bible is clear. Jesus will come again. And as we say in the Creed each and every week, he would, will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. And as much as we may not want to hear it or believe it, when that day comes, there will be a judgment and destruction on the ungodly. And that is serious. All the things that are wrong with the world, all the things that are outside of God's plan and vision and heart, and the things and all the people who are far from God and have rejected him, they will be held to account. And they will be held to account by him. But Peter says that that's not God's preference. He is slow in coming again. He's slow not, not because he's a sluggard. He, he hasn't fallen asleep. 
No, he's slow in coming because he is patient. And because he desires that we might all repent and turn to him. And let's, let's be clear here. That this isn't universalism. Universalism is the idea that everyone will be saved. But the Bible indicates that there will be people who will not repent. And I haven't found anywhere in scripture that supports the idea that the people who do not repent will still be able to experience the blessing and dwelling of God's presence. If you, you know of something in the Bible to the contrary, then please come talk to me. Let's get a coffee this week and, and you can show me that and we can look at it together. Because I want to hear, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest what the Bible has to say. Because I believe that God has spoken. And that he has spoken truthfully and sufficiently through the prophets and the apostles who have recorded and written down these words for us. And the Bible, it's not an encyclopedia of all the information that's ever been known or will ever be known in the world. It's not Wikipedia. But I believe that the scriptures are sufficient for teaching us the way of salvation. And that's actually what they tell us that they do. And Peter says that God doesn't want anyone to perish. Rather, he desires everyone to come to repentance. But he doesn't force that on us. Everyone who does repent will be saved. And God's made sure of that by the cross of Jesus Christ. But not everyone will choose to repent. Some will perish. But that's not God's preference. He doesn't will that to happen. And if we are hearing that rightly, it should cause our hearts to, to ache. It should cause our hearts to break. And as I've been sitting with this this week, it certainly has done that for me. You see, we can't believe this flippantly or casually. And if we do, then our hearts have become hardened. Because, you see, God's heart breaks over this topic. That's why he's patient with us. That's why Jesus went to the cross God himself came to earth in the person of Jesus Christ, and he came because he loves us, because he loves you. Jesus comes because he loves us. He always comes with love. He loves this world that he has made, and he loves each and every person that's ever walked on the face of this earth, and he won't force us to love him back, because that would not be love. But he yearns for us to love him and to know his love for us. He yearns for us to repent and to turn to him, to know him and to live and dwell with him. And as we dwell in these things, and as we inwardly digest them together, Peter shows us that not only is God not bound by our expectations of him, but he is also more patient and more merciful and more, more loving than we could ever begin to comprehend, more than we could ever begin to hope. So don't forget who God is. Don't forget what he has said, what he has done, and what he will still do. Peter says Jesus will come, and we can be sure of it. And, and this isn't something that we should fear. He says it's actually something that we should hope for. In, in verses 10 through 13, we read, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed by fire in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed at its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we're looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. Now, Peter hasn't suddenly put on a, a tinfoil hat. He's not making any stuff up here. But he's again drawing from the Old Testament. And he's drawing from those things that Jesus told him when he was with him. And I think we can sometimes miss the point of passages like this. Because we can start getting lost in some of these peculiar details. And, and there's a lot of peculiar details in this part of the passage. But I don't think that's the point. I don't think it's helpful. To get lost in those details. I really appreciate what the Bible scholar Michael Green says on this. He writes, those who think that they can map out a detailed program of what will happen at the second coming should remember that despite all the prophecies of scripture, 
Nobody got the details of the first coming right. That's really good, isn't it? You know, the, the, all these prophecies about when Jesus was going to come and, and everyone had all these ideas and, and no one got it right. So how, how can we expect to get everything right for the time he comes back? You see, Pete, what Peter's writing here, it isn't a how-to manual about how to bring about the apocalypse. And it's not a plan or a map for how to navigate it all. Peter isn't telling us to consign the world to burning away. He isn't saying, let it all burn. This isn't a descent into fatalism or apathy. Do you see what he says? He says in verse 11, since everything will be destroyed by fire in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. He says that, yes, the world is going to come to an end one day. And how you live right now matters. We aren't living to hasten the destruction of the world. We are to live holy and godly lives, stewarding and caring for the world that God has made, and presenting ourselves to him, saying, God, won't you come? Won't you come? And as we do that, we feel the ache of the world not being as it should be. The heartbreak of people rejecting God and his ways. The brokenness of this world as it's marred by war and calamity, and as it's already burning from division and enmity. We aren't hoping for the world to burn. We're experiencing the burning of the world already, and we're crying out, God, help! Lord, make speed to save us. God, make haste to help us. We look forward to the day that God will come again, because he will come again, and he will make all things new. There's a lot in this passage that I struggle to understand, but, but what I see and what I know is this. Jesus is coming back, and that is a really good thing. It's a thing to hope for. It's a thing to long for. Because amid just all the stuff that will come with his return, at the end of the day, Peter says, in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. The place where righteousness dwells. You see, he is going to make it right. Jesus is going to come and make it right. So as we hear, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest these words from Second Peter, may we know and dwell on this. Jesus is coming again one day. And he is patient in his coming. He is patient because he desires that we would all repent and turn to him. But Jesus will come. He will come again one day and he will judge the living and the dead and he will make all things right and his kingdom will have no end. Will you pray with me? Blessed Lord, who caused all Holy Scripture to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them Read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, so that by patience and the comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, that we may long for the coming of Jesus Christ when he will come and make all things right. And you will do this through our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen.